Hi everyone, I'm glad you could join me today for this virtual talk. I'll be talking about some of the lessons we learned from da building Databricks large-scale multi-cloud data platform. First, an introduction. My name is Jeff Peng, and I'm a principal engineer in our platform engineering team at Databricks. Before Databricks, I was working to derive value from petabytes of mobile phone data at at t Research, which was really tough back then in the days of Hadoop and MapReduce. This really opened my eyes to the potential of big data if only more enterprises had the ability to process it quickly and easily at scale. Databricks helps data teams, such as my former group, solve the world's toughest data problems. And my team's mission is to allow us to expand fast and iterate quickly. If you're interested, you can find out more information about us at our careers page here. As you might know, Databricks was founded a few years ago by the original careers of Apache Spark. Since then, we've introduced other open source projects, such as Delta Lake, MLflow, and Koalas. We've provided a data and AI platform that now serves more than 5,000 customers in a variety of industries, including more than 40% of the Fortune 500. We're still a startup, but we've grown to over 2,300 employees, and we have over, uh, over 600 million in annual revenue. Our data platform provides a unified analytics and AI platform to data scientists, data engineers, and business users. It includes a data science workspace that integrates tools like Notebooks, MLflow, and TensorFlow. It has a unified data service built on an optimized deployment of Apache Spark and Delta Lake. And it's built on top of an enterprise cloud service that is simple, scalable, and secure because we manage the operations for our customers. So what's in this talk? Well, first, I'll give a brief overview of what a modern data platform looks like. Then I'll describe three challenges and lessons that we learned while building it. First, I'll discuss what it takes to operate successfully in multiple clouds, which is a key aspect of our architecture today. Second, I'll go back in time and describe how we evolved our data platform from zero to 5,000 customers. It turns out that the factory to use to build and evolve the data platform may be more important than the actual data platform itself. And finally, I'll describe some of the ongoing work on how we use data and AI to accelerate the data platform itself. Databricks is largely built on top of itself, and we're actually one of our own largest customers. This recursive nature of our architecture allows us to continue to scale and evolve in a unique way. But first, let's look at the architecture of the Databricks data platform itself. In a simple data engineering architecture, you might use a single Spark cluster to process data from your data lake, which could be data stored in S3 or HDFS or some other data service. You might take this through several stages of a data processing pipeline to refine the data for use. And finally, you'd have analytics and reporting applications built on top of this data to actually provide value for your users. Now, most modern data platforms actually have many different data pipelines. They would involve streaming data in addition to your data lake, might involve scheduling more complicated workflows where the output of one job is processed by the input of another. And you probably use a modern data format like Delta and your applications would involve streaming analytics, notebooks, machine learning, AI, and more. To do all these things, you would need many different Spark clusters of scale. And to manage these Spark clusters, you'd probably need a cluster management system like Mesos or Kubernetes. This is the type of architecture with that many organizations are using or trying to build to get more and more value out of their data. The Databricks data platform provides this for thousands of our customers. We manage a control plane which handles analytics, collaboration, AI, workflows, customer management, reporting, business insights, and more, so their customers don't need to do that themselves. And we manage many Spark clusters in our customers' preferred networks to process data from all of their existing streaming data and data lakes. Furthermore, our data platform is deployed in many regions throughout the world because we have customers everywhere, and it's critical for the data platform to be close to where the data is. And because our customers have their data in more than one cloud, we replicate these deployments across several clouds and integrate with the best features of each of these clouds. The Databricks data platform is thus a global scale, multi-cloud platform that manages the data for thousands of customers around the world. That's the Databricks control plane in a nutshell. And that's what will be the main subject of this talk. Our control plane has hundreds of thousands of users, hundreds of thousands of Spark clusters every day, and millions of VMs managed per day, and petabytes of uh, data processed each day. Our data platform supports everyone from university students trying out Spark for the very first time in our free community edition to Fortune 500 companies with thousands of users and many complex workloads. In the remainder of this talk, I'll discuss some of the big lessons that we learned from building this large-scale multi-cloud data platform. As we just saw, 
Uh, multi-cloud is a key aspect of our architecture. So let's talk about how we run Databricks on multiple clouds. Databricks runs on AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. Why do we do this? Well, because the data platform needs to be where the data is. Putting the data platform in the same data center in, as data impacts performance, latency, and data transfer costs. It allows us to integrate with the best features of each of these clouds, and also it allows us to adhere to the data governance policies of our customer desired cloud. The biggest challenge in supporting multiple clouds is to do so without sacrificing the velocity of feature development for the data platform itself. Iterating quickly is the key to extending and expanding the data platform. What we found is that a cloud agnostic layer is the key to maintain the developer velocity, but it also needs to integrate with the standards of each cloud and to manage their quirks. Let's discuss what I mean. The developer experience on different clouds is pretty divergent, so it's pretty hard to build the same thing on each cloud. For example, many cloud services have no direct equivalents. For example, AWS has a great scalable key value document store called DynamoDB, but the same interface doesn't exist in Azure. Cloud APIs don't look anything like each other. Even the authentication and access control um, mechanisms are different in each cloud. Operational tools for each cloud are very different, and you can't even consume logs in the same format. This makes it challenging to support multiple clouds without doing a lot of extra work. To overcome this, we built a cloud agnostic developer framework to support our data platform. Between these blue lines in this diagram are services that make our data platform itself, such as SQL, notebooks, job scheduling, MFlow, cluster management, etc. To make sure that these services can operate seamlessly on multiple clouds, we develop a service framework API that's common across the different clouds that we support. This API builds upon a few lowest common denominator services that are pretty similar in each cloud, things like virtual machines, networks, databases, and load balancers. When a Databricks engineer works on MLflow, for example, they would use our service framework API to manage things like APIs, users, and permissions, billing, testing, and deployment. They will write the code once and don't need to worry about the differences in each of these clouds. Nonetheless, we learned that not everything can be cloud agnostic, no matter how much we try to abstract away the details. First, customers actually want to integrate with what's best about each cloud, and we want to support those standards. Second, even the lowest common denominator to cloud services like VMs have implementation quirks with that reveal themselves once you start building on top of them. To handle the standards of each of the clouds, our service framework acts as an abstraction layer for the differences in each cloud. On this slide, we compare AWS and Azure, but similar abstractions exist for a Google Cloud as well. For example, the ways in each cloud does authentication and authorization, key management, billing, and storage are pretty different. Yet most data platform features need to be deeply integrate with each of these properties. To harmonize the differences in each cloud, our service framework API abstracts away the differences as much as possible so that a service like MLflow just needs to know about our service framework notion of authentication and key management rather than the notion of each cloud. As another example, consider storage. Both S3 and Azure Data Lake are the most common and cost-effective ways to store large data objects in each of AWS and Azure and this typically formed the basis for most data lakes. However, S3 is eventually consistent, whereas Azure Data Lake is strongly consistent. That is, after writing a file into S3, the next read of that file isn't guaranteed to see the same data where it is in Azure Data Lake. Obviously, having each application deal with the difference in consistency models would be a big headache. So we abstracted this difference away with something called an S3 commit service which makes S3 as strongly consistent as Azure Data Lake when using our service framework. The abstraction layer to handle different cloud standards is necessary, but it's insufficient to make our cloud service framework cloud agnostic. In reality, even the so-called common cloud services have quirks that are a nightmare to deal with, even if you try to lift something from one cloud and make it work in another. For example, consider virtual machines. With tools like Packer, it's pretty easy to make the exact same image in each cloud. However, using VMs as elastic compute, the creation and deletion of those VMs matters a lot to the user experience. And if you're not careful about adapting to cloud limits and APIs, rate limits, you might create and delete VMs faster on one cloud than the cloud can return them uh, to your quota. Similarly, we found that different clouds handle TCP connections very differently. Invisible mailboxes will time out and close your connections without warning. 
Small differences in data center networking hardware and reliability can cause catastrophic application failures. For example, you may recall that in 2019, there was a major security vulnerability in the TCP stack of the Linux kernel. Unfortunately, the initial fix to this vulnerability had a bug that could hang TCP connections when there are certain patterns of packet loss. We only experienced hung TCP connections, which were a real big pain to diagnose and debug, in one of our clouds because the packet loss of that cloud was just a bit higher than the others. Finally, even though you can run MySQL in all the clouds, it isn't actually the same. Things you might think would be trivial, like the case sensitivity of underlying operating system, reach into the database to bite you if you aren't careful. To make a truly cloud agnostic platform layer, we're continually sussing out these quirks and trying to mask them from everyday developers. So those are some of the challenges and lessons of our current multi-cloud platform, but how do we get here? Now let's go back in time and see how we grew our software as a service data platform to see uh, to where it is today. As a startup, we obviously didn't start out with a global scale multi-cloud data platform. The challenge was to grow a data platform that provided a lot of value for one customer to thousands, all within the span of a few years. Since we managed the data platform for our customers, we wanted to keep expanding the capabilities of what our customers could do with it. And we learned that the data platform itself isn't actually the most important thing to do that. Actually, it's the factory that builds and evolves the data platform um, is more important than the data platform itself, because that allows us to rapidly provide more value and support more use cases in our data platform over time, all in a way that happens transparently for our users. So what were some of the keys to success in building a great data platform factory? Well, first, we needed to quickly deliver value to the market. For example, we provided version one of our data platform, which included some analytics tools like notebooks, but very quickly had to provide a version two that also included job scheduling and management. The challenge in iterating quickly in our data platform is that our users are using and, and relying on it at the same time. So we need to make sure we don't break things while we're continuously changing it. The key to success in establishing this virtual cycle were our modern continuous integrations infrastructure, fast development tools, and a lot of testing. For example, at Databricks, we make heavy use of Scala, Bazel, and React.js. We spend a lot of time optimizing our Scala builds to get up to 500x speedups compared to default tooling. And we run tens of millions of tests every day to make sure that changes don't break things. And our developers create hundreds of Databricks in a box full of control plane environments every day to develop and test new features in isolation. This allows us to keep adding features to our data platform very rapidly. Secondly, we need to quickly expand the total budget addressable market by replicating our control plans in many environments. The challenge is that each environment is slightly different. There are different clouds, different regions, and different data governance zones that require different configurations. So this quickly becomes very complex if we want to support all these different environments and iterate quickly to update them with the latest features. The keys to success to expand quickly was to focus heavily on declarative infrastructure, where we rely solely on templates that describe our different control plans and use a modern continuous deployment infrastructure to deploy them. At Databricks, we use a templating language called JSONnet, and we use Terraform and Spinnaker to form the basis of our deployment pipelines. This allows us to express millions of lines of configuration and much fewer lines of code, and also allows us to deliver new features to our data platform globally several times each month. Finally, we wanted to expand the workloads that our customers could run on Databricks even after they've adopted our data platform. This meant that we needed to expand the scale at which our data platform could operate and simultaneously scale the rate at which new features can be added to the data platform over time. As more and more of our engineers developed features for our data platform, we needed to make sure they weren't all reinventing the wheel. The first key to success to scale quickly was to have a service framework that did a bunch of heavy lifting for all the data platform features. Things like container management, APIs, rate limits, metrics, logging, secret management, et cetera, these are all things that all features need from notebooks to SQL to MLflow, but aren't core to their functionality. The second piece of success was to decompose monolithic services into microservices. For example, when we first started, our cluster manager was a single machine managing a few hundred VMs for a customer. But to support millions of VMs that we manage today, we had to break it apart into several core functions so that it could scale. A well-rounded service framework was the key to doing this rapidly. In summary, the Databricks data platform allowed us to iterate on our data platform very quickly, rapidly replicate it across many regions and clouds, and expand the scale and breadth of workloads it could support. 
One of the great things about having a solid factory is that we often use it to improve the factory itself as well. You can see from this diagram that we use a lot of cloud-native open source technologies at Databricks, from Envoy and GraphQL for RPCs, and APIs to Kubernetes for container management, and Terraform and Spinnaker for deployments. But we didn't start out with all these technologies. Heck, even when Databricks started, many of these open source projects didn't exist. By taking a factory approach to our development process, we're continually retool our factory to incorporate and extend the best tools out there, essentially using the factory to improve and refine itself. So now that I've described the key aspects of a multi-cloud data platform and the factory that we use to evolve it to where it is today, let's look at one final key foundation of its continued evolution. The last lesson I want to talk about is how important it is to use data in AI to accelerate the data platform itself. It's really hard to build and operate a data platform without a lot of data in AI. Thus, Databricks is actually one of our largest customers. A data platform needs data to track usage, maintain its security. It also needs data to observe the users of the data platform and improve it for them. It needs data to keep itself up and running. And we found that having a simple and powerful data platform like Databricks was essential to building itself. We use Databricks ourselves for many things. We need it for key platform features like billing and audit logs, which process big data. And we do analytics on feature usage and trends and model growth and churn and other forecasts, which also operate on a large amount of data. And finally, the data platform is a managed service, and a managed service needs real-time data to operate effectively. We use Databricks for mission-critical developer operations, analyzing everything from APIs to KPIs and Spark debug logs. To do all of this, we built several globally distributed data pipelines with the Databricks data platform as its foundation. Like our service deployments, we use declarative templates to deploy our data pipelines so that we can rapidly iterate and replicate them. And we have a templating tool called the Stack CLI that you can use yourself to deploy these data pipelines in Databricks. Each of our globally distributed deployments streams data to our data processing engine, which is built on top of Databricks and Delta. But it also integrates tightly with other big data uh, tools, such as Prometheus, Elasticsearch, and Jaeger, to allow us to see, analyze, and model the usage and health of the Databricks data platform in real time and historically. This data platform allows us to tie all this data together. Right now, this data pipeline processes hundreds of terabytes of logs per day and analyzes millions of time series in real time. This pipeline has been essential to the continued evolution of the data platform um, and, its, um, and what it's built on. And thus, Databricks accelerates itself. So in summary, the Databricks architecture processes data on millions of VMs around the world in multiple clouds. We learned several important things while building this massive scale data platform. First, a cloud agnostic platform that integrates with each cloud standards and quirks is the key to multi-cloud. And it's harder to do than it first appears because of the performance scaling and integration needs of big data. Second, the factory that builds and evolves the data platform is more important than the data platform itself. The data platform tomorrow won't look like the one of today, and the factory is what will build it. Finally, data and AI can accelerate data platform features, product analytics, and DevOps. You can't really build a large-scale data platform without a lot of data. I hope these takeaways help or inspire you in your own systems design and evolution. Oh, and PS, if you're excited by anything in this talk, Databricks Engineering is hiring. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a good day.